Good morning, church. Welcome to worship this morning. We're so glad to have you with us. If you are visiting for the first or second time today and you have questions, please visit the bright orange wall you passed on your way here. There are people there who can answer your questions. We'd love to get to know you. And I'd like to say thank you to Brianna Wojcik, who is filling in for Mark today, who is on vacation. Thank you, Brianna, for playing for us, even with a broken foot, you might say up here. So thank you, Brianna. <laughs> And then a couple of church family announcements. Uh, Sharon Gorman passed away this last week, and her service came up very quickly. It was uh, this past Thursday. And if you would like to reach out to the Gorman family, there are cards that look like this at the front desk with the family address. If you would like to pick one up and send the family a card. So please keep the Gorman family in your prayers. And the funeral for Daryl Burris will be held this Saturday at 11 o'clock, the visitation at 10 o'clock, and the reception following as well. So please keep the Burris family also in your prayers this week. And with that, I'd like to invite you to please rise for our opening hymn as we remember the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. We gather this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. 1 John 1 tells us, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And trusting in that promise from the word of God, I invite you in this moment to silently confess your sins before your God. Most merciful God, we confess that without Christ, we are in bondage to sin, and we cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. 
hear the good news. Almighty God in his mercy sent Jesus to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. In the authority of scripture and by the power of the blood of Jesus Christ, I tell you by his promise that what you have confessed has been forgiven in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. I don't see any kids in here today, and so I'm going to hold on to the mystery box for next week. You do have some. Would you guys like to come up for the mystery box? Okay, here we go. The whole room is happy for you guys. <laughs> Come on up. Well, the mystery box is an item that somebody put in here that I don't know anything about that I, that's neither living nor was once living, and then I can see what it tells us about God. So can we give me a drum roll? Dun, oh, my goodness. What in the world? <laughs> okay. Well, have you guys seen anything like this before? Well, you, when you crank it up, it's a, whoa. Yeah, that's kind of scary, isn't it? And kind of funny. <laughs> I don't know who put this in there or why, but. So what do you notice about this? What is, what's going on here? What is this? Teeth. Teeth and a mouth, right? Yes. And what are these? Feet. Feet. It's teeth with feet, right? A mouth with feet. Well, what this reminds me of is that there is a scripture that tells us that blessed are the feet that go and that bring someone to tell the good news. So that's all this is, is feet and a mouth, right? So that we're called to share the good news about who Jesus is and what he's done for us in our lives. Um, but in order for people to hear that, our feet have to go somewhere, right? They have to go, yeah, to where other people are, Right? So these are the most important parts of that scripture, the feet and the mouth. <laughs> but I think we also need the heart, right? Because if we just talk without thinking about yeah, giving the love, that's right. So the feet and the mouth and the love. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's all pretty fun, isn't it? Well, let's have a prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this reminder today uh, that you call us to go and to tell, uh, to let what you have done in our hearts and in our lives uh, not just end with us, but that you uh, send us, Lord, to, to go and to tell everyone around us uh, of who you are and the power of your love. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thanks for coming up, you guys. Are you coming back next week? Do you know if you want to take the mystery box? If you're not, we'll just have somebody else fill it. But we, you can ask your parents, and they can come find me after, okay? All right. Thanks for coming up, you guys. You guys can go. All right. Our service continues with our reading. The reading today is from the book of Proverbs, chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. My son... If you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, if you have trapped, been trapped by what you said and snared by the words of your mouth, so do this, my son, to free yourself, since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands. Go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider it, its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler. Yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Please rise for the reading of the gospel.
gospel reading for today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 28 through 31. Jesus said, What do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and said, Son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But later he changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. The word of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Please be seated. Good morning. Welcome to those who are joining us in the Fellowship Hall and online this morning. This summer, we've been learning from the written wisdom of Solomon in Proverbs and the wisdom we see put into practice through Jesus' life and ministry. And so far, most of the wisdom we've been receiving is preventative wisdom, things that keep us from making costly mistakes. But preventative wisdom can only take us so far because what if you've already made those mistakes? I'm sure we've all been in that place where after making a mess of things, someone is right there to share with you their wisdom of how they managed to never make the terrible mistake you made. Thank you so very much for that. I'll just jump right into my time machine and go back and take your advice. <laughs> there is a time and a place for preventative wisdom. But when you're already in the pit, you need a very different kind of wisdom to apply. What you need then is to have a white hot fire of hope lit under your feet. Because at this point, discouragement becomes your worst enemy. And that's what this section of Proverbs is about. It's very practical advice for after you've gotten yourself stuck. And this advice is clearly coming from someone who's been there. Proverbs 6, 1 through 2 says, My son, if you have put up security for your neighbor, if you have shaken hands and pledged for a stranger, you have been trapped by what you said, ensnared by the words of your mouth. Basically, you co-signed for someone else's loan and you are now legally responsible for a debt that wasn't yours, but it is now. And your life can't move forward until their debt is paid. That's the kind of stuck this passage is talking about. But it could apply to any kind of situation where you have made mistakes that have gotten you stuck. So if that's where you are, the author of Proverbs goes on to say, so do this, my son, to free yourself. Since you have fallen into your neighbor's hands, go to the point of exhaustion and give your neighbor no rest. Allow no sleep to your eyes, no slumber to your eyelids. Free yourself like a gazelle from the hand of the hunter, like a bird from the snare of the fowler. What it's saying is, once you realize you've made a mistake, that you've done things that have hurt yourself or your future or that of others, this is no time to wallow in self-pity or self-loathing. Spending your energy on complaining, this isn't fair, or beating yourself up, how could I have made that mistake, are both complete wastes of energy. Now is not the time to wallow. Now is the time to floor it. Pedal to the metal, people. Make a plan and work the plan. Go, go, go until you see daylight, until you break free. Then you can fold your hands and rest. Then you can revisit how you managed to make that mistake and how you can avoid making it again. It's saying the moment you've recognized you've gotten yourself stuck, that's the time to do something about it. So if you feel stuck because you've gotten yourself in debt, make a plan of how you're going to work your way out and start now. If you feel stuck because you've made mistakes in the arena of your health and you need to make dramatic life changes for the sake of your future health, make a plan and start now. If you've damaged a relationship, don't wait to address it. Confess. Apologize now. Jesus even says in Matthew 5, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. 
Jesus says, do what you can do to make it right and do it now. Because Proverbs shows us if you don't do it now, it's very easy to become paralyzed with regret or shame or overthinking or fear and end up bogged down and stuck. When you know what you need to do, do it. Do it now. Take the first step because only in taking that first step will lead you to the next. And this is wisdom we need to hear because it's the exact opposite of what we want to do, right? When we're feeling broken or discouraged, the very last thing we want to do is act, to plan, to go. So knowing that, the author of Proverbs addresses it in verses 9 through 11. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. He's saying the only way forward is through. And the first time I heard anyone lift up this wisdom from Proverbs was about 10 years ago in the Financial Peace University course. And at the time, all the staff were asked to take it. And although to me, number talk sounded incredibly boring, once I started with the course, I quickly realized it wasn't actually about numbers. It was about hope and discipline doing little things now that over time will build toward a better direction. And it was also about trust, trusting that no matter how dark a pit you're in, there is a way forward. It might be a long, hard journey, but one small step at a time, things will move, and you don't have to walk that road alone. Since the author of that course had, through his own mistakes, been bankrupt twice and had to build up again from below scratch, he knew in those circumstances these momentum-producing words from Proverbs were exactly what he had needed, and that's why he was sharing them. If you see no future from where you are, know that's what the Lord wants to show you one step at a time. And if you need to be able to see a possible roadmap, that's when you need the community to help you see it for you. Because truly, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> Whatever problem that you're facing, most likely someone here has already faced it at one time. And they might have some good wisdom for you as well. The truth is, we need each other. And we need the Lord's encouragement and guidance to keep taking one step at a time, moving forward in faith so we can see his work unfold in us. Because if discouragement is the tool most often used by the enemy of our souls to keep us stuck, our biggest obstacle is our inability to see that the little things we do, the little course correction adjustments that we make actually matter. So Proverbs tells us to take our cue from the ant. Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. If you're thinking about an, an ant, it's amazing what an ant accomplishes. Just relentlessly doing what needs to be done, one little piece of sand at a time, until amazing things are built. Jesus tells us, that the kingdom of God is like a tiny mustard seed that day after day, in time, grows into a plant big enough to shade everything around it. And Jesus shows us that in his hands, five loaves and two fish offered up by one person in faith can become food for 5,000. And Jesus reveals these kinds of things over and over again because he wants us to know that when we entrust to God the little things we can do in faith, we'll see not just the fruit of our work, but the fruit of his work in us and through us as well. But nobody can steer a vehicle that isn't moving. It takes a step of faith for us to start to be able to see where he's directing us. So if you feel stuck, if you want the Lord to steer you, Proverbs says, it's time to take a step in faith. During the initial lockdown of COVID, when nobody really knew what this was we were facing, a lot of people found themselves trapped in a sense of hopelessness. 
And during this time, my sister sent me a video that was made using some excerpts from a graduation speech to the University of Texas in 2014 by Navy Special Forces Admiral William H. McRaven. And in this speech, he made a startling statement. He said, if you want to change the world, start by making your bed. When the mountain in front of you seems insurmountable, wisdom says, choose to do what you can do. Because in doing the little things, you're reminded things can be done, and that changes you. I'd like to share this video with you. Workers diagnosed with a virus represent 14% of all those cases. And unemployment claims are higher than they have ever been in our history. If you want to change the world, start off by making your bed. If you make your bed every morning, you will have accomplished the first task of the day. It will give you a small sense of pride, and it will encourage you to do another task, and another, and another. And a made bed gives you encouragement that tomorrow will be better. I've been a Navy SEAL for 36 years. Every morning, my instructors, who at the time were all Vietnam veterans, would show up in my barracks room and the first thing they'd do was inspect my bed. The corners would be square, the covers would be pulled tight, the pillow centered just under the headboard, and the extra blanket folded neatly at the foot of the rack. It was a simple task, mundane at best, but every morning we were required to make our bed to perfection. It seemed a little ridiculous at the time, particularly in light of the fact that we were aspiring to be real warriors, tough, battle-hardened seals. But the wisdom of this simple act has been proven to me many times over. And by the end of the day, that one task completed will have turned into many tasks completed. Making your bed will also reinforce the fact that the little things in life matter. If you can't do the little things right, you'll never be able to do the big things right. Our struggles in this world are similar, and the lessons to overcome those struggles and to move forward, changing ourselves and changing the world around us will apply equally to all. At times, it will test you to your very core. It will be painful. It will be discouraging. At that darkest moment of the mission is a time when you need to be calm and your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. But changing the world can happen anywhere and anyone can do it. If I have learned anything in my time traveling the world, it is the power of hope, the power of one person. One person can change the world by giving people hope. Start each day with a task completed. Find someone to help you through life. Respect everyone. Know that life is not fair and that you will fail often. But if you step up when the times are the toughest, lift up the downtrodden and never ever give up. If you do these things, the next generation and the generations that follow will live in a world far better than the one we have today. And what started here will indeed have changed the world for the better. But the question is, what will the world look like after you change it? At the darkest moment of the mission is when you need to be calm. And your inner strength must be brought to bear. If you want to change the world, you must be your very best in the darkest moments. Wisdom is meant to be practical, but I have to admit, if I were not a Christian, that would sound like a setup for failure. <laughs> 
Because how do we find calm, find strength to be at our best even in our darkest moments? Well, it comes from knowing deep down to our core that we are not alone. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. That's where the calm comes from. From knowing our inner strength comes not from us, but from the one who is at work within us. The reason I found this clip so encouraging was because I know the one who is with me in my darkest moments. The inner strength we need is found in our intimacy with God. And we grow in our ability to access that peace through the spiritual discipline of repeatedly turning to him, even in the small things, daily inviting him in, listening for him, looking for where he's at work, so that when we do fall into what's too big for us, we know that it's not too big for him. Because the truth is, he's already done the biggest work for us. You see, Jesus has already willingly co-signed our sin debt, knowing full well that we would all default on it, that he would need him to carry it all for us. And through the sacrificial work of his death and resurrection, he has delivered us from having to pay for that debt. He has marked the debt of our sin paid in full. What we give to Jesus truly will be forgiven. But although he's put the fire out and we are saved by his redeeming work alone, there's always still the matter of the mess that our actions leave behind. And if we want our lives to go in a better direction, that doesn't just take confession and forgiveness, it also takes repentance. To repent means to turn around, to change direction, to accept course correction. Because Jesus doesn't just want to forgive you, He also wants to walk with you in ways that make your life and the lives around you better. Because the truth is, when we do things that hurt ourselves and others, although these things can be forgiven, they also need to be rebuilt. And that process is often hard. It takes sacrifice and work, and it'll probably be slow to repair the damage of your mistakes, to rebuild trust, even trust in yourself. But it can be done. And it will be done as you dare to put your trust in the one who meets you right where you are every step of the way. Because no matter where you are, Jesus sees you and knows you and loves you. And he wants to walk with you on the way forward, one step at a time. But we find the wisdom of Jesus will only change the direction of our lives when we trust him enough to do what he says. Most often we feel stuck in life because we keep trying to travel in a direction that's different than the one where the Lord wants to lead us. And our joy, our purpose, our meaning, our fulfillment in life are directly connected to the direction of our focus. So if you're feeling stuck, it might be time to get in motion. And if we're going to dare get up and take a step, what does scripture show us about where the Lord wants to direct our feet? Well, one of my favorite parables addresses this in Matthew 21. Jesus said, what do you think? There was a man who had two sons. He went to the first and he said, son, go and work today in the vineyard. I will not, he answered. But he later changed his mind and went. Then the father went to the other son and said the same thing. He answered, I will, sir. But he did not go. Which of the two did what his father wanted? The first, they answered. Jesus said to them, truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to show you the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes did. And even after you saw this, you did not repent and believe him. So in the parable, why did the one brother initially say to the father, no, I will not work in the vineyard? He initially refused because he thought he wanted to be doing something else with his time, devoting his life to something else that would be better. But eventually he began to realize this vineyard he was asked to tend wasn't just his father's vineyard. It was his father's life's work for his sake. 
that this vineyard built by his father was a gift and an invitation to him to be his provision, his legacy, his future. So even though initially he refused this gift and the calling to tend it, in the end he realized the beauty and the value of that gift, and he quietly, humbly took up his pruning shears and began tending the vines. In a similar way, the tax collectors and sinners that Jesus met had been trying to find what they needed in life by turning away from what Father God had called them to as well. They'd been looking for life in places that had only delivered despair. But after hearing Jesus' call specifically to them, the Father's call, come home, they realized they were being offered a different kind of future. And humbling themselves, they turned their focus from theirs to his in taking a step. And as disciples of Jesus, their lives made disciples of Jesus because people couldn't help but see the fire of hope lit under their feet was leading them towards something better because they trusted that the best of all someones had already taken a step toward them. And that's how they ended up tending the vineyard of the Father. Because the harvest Jesus is looking to be tended is made up of hearts that need hope. Hearts that have already fallen into mistakes who know that they need his tending. And their growing led to growth in others. Whereas the second son in the parable said, Yes, of course I will do what you say. I love the fact that this vineyard is my family legacy. But then he didn't actually do the work of tending the vineyard. (laughs) The people who claimed to already be godly themselves in Jesus' crowd hadn't actually bothered to live out their love for God by tending to the hearts of their neighbor as he tends ours, which turns out is the work that leads to the vineyard's ongoing, growing harvest. They talk the talk, but they didn't walk the walk. And Jesus is saying, who actually did what the Father asks? See, it turns out the way of righteousness, as we live continually putting our trust in the Father, is also a life of tending hearts as he does ours. And as such, it's also a life of ongoing course correction, continual pruning, repenting, confessing, asking for help when we're stuck, and taking the next step trusting that he will direct our feet one step at a time into what's fruitful. Do you see how he's been tending his vineyard through your life? Or are you ready for a new step? Once we realize we've gotten stuck, where do we start? Well, no one can steer a vehicle that's not moving, so it's time to move. Start by confessing where you're stuck, to the Lord. I love the confession that we do every week in the traditional service. I know that some people don't love repetition, but it never gets old for me because every week I remember how I haven't loved the Lord with all my heart or loved my neighbor as myself. Every week I'm reminded that I need a holy reset. I need the Lord to forgive me, renew me, lead me, so that I can delight in his will and walk in his ways to the glory of his holy name. I first need the courage that comes from knowing I have been forgiven by him so that I can forgive, so that I can ask for the forgiveness of others, so I can move forward unstuck. I need to know I have a hope and a future, a legacy given to me by his grace before I can work on building or rebuilding what needs tending around me. And because Jesus shares his title, his sonship with us, in receiving that grace and that title, our whole identity, our whole future is changed. We have an inheritance, a legacy, an eternal home. And because you are a child and heir of the Father, this isn't just his vineyard, it's also yours. So as 1 John 3.18 says, let us not just love with words and talk, but true love which shows itself in action. And maybe that next step comes in leaning into the community. Think about opportunities to learn together through groups this fall as you seek to continue to grow. 
or ways to grow in the inner strength of greater intimacy with God through daily intentional moments with him. Maybe find a new devotional. Set some time aside for him in a new way. And when you see a heart that needs tending in his vineyard, respond to the Lord's leading and dare take a step. Share your own story of where you find your hope and your strength. And we often grow the most when we help another grow. It turns out that's how the Lord made us. That we were made to point each other toward the one who loves us. See, there is a vineyard, beloved, a kingdom and a home the Father loves. And having adopted you as his child through Jesus' saving work, he wants to share that gift and that calling with you so it can be shared through you. You see, one person has already changed the world by giving it hope. His name is Jesus. And one step at a time, one heart at a time, he will continue to do so in us and through us as we dare trust him with each step. So what step is he leading you to take today? When you see it, do it. Do it now. And see where he leads you. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for taking the first step to us, for coming to meet us, Lord, when we're broken, when we're stuck. Lord, thank you that you meet us right here in your grace. But Lord, as you look out over a world that very much needs your healing touch, your hope, and your love, we pray, Lord, that you would help us to tend the vineyard around us, that you would show us, Lord, how you've uniquely created each and every one of us to bless this world, to bless those hearts that need you. Help us, Lord, to take one small step today in growing in love, in love toward you and toward each other. Lord, help us to see how you're calling us to take a step in tending your vineyard so that the world may know your love. All these things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let us profess together our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our worship continues with the giving of our tithes and offerings to the Lord.
Would you please rise? In the Old Testament, there is a story where Elijah, after uh, celebrating the power of God on Mount Carmel, is running for his life in the aftermath of that and finding himself discouraged and fearful and tired. Uh, an angel comes to meet him and tells him to get up and eat and drink lest the journey be too much for him. And with that food from heaven, Elijah is refreshed to be able to move forward another day. And for all of us, uh, as we are journeying in this world, we also have the gift of a meal, of food from heaven, the nourishment that Jesus gives us in his body and blood to meet us right where we are, to show us that God sees us and knows us and wants to equip us from the inside out with his strength to be our strength on the journey. For on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. And again after the supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Please join me in praying the prayer Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. As you come forward to receive this meal today, the ushers will send you up the side aisles. At the first station, you can receive a wafer of bread or a gluten-free wafer. And then at the next station, either wine or grape juice. The wine is a deep red on the outside of the tray. The grape juice is a lighter color in the center. And after you've received the blood of Christ, you can proceed to the middle where there'll be an empty basket where you can put your empty cup. Please come to the table. All has been prepared for you.
may the body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, which you have now received, bless you and keep you in his grace. Amen. We have first and next steps that you can continue to take as you grow together. And the first one is just kind of a fun opportunity. You have one more week to sign up for August 15th, Lutheran Night at the Twins at Target Field. The Twins are taking on the Detroit Lions at 640. You can sign up online or at the information desk for a ticket. They're just $17 a person. Uh, we're going to be enjoying a home run porch view. It's dollar dog night, and there are special family concessions in place. And Pastor Darren will be joining a Lutheran uh, choir to sing the national anthem on the field. So if you would like to sign up, the deadline is July 23rd. And then also uh, today, our school tools drive continues. It goes through August 6th. And this is just a very practical way to show the love of Christ by helping the kids in our local schools and kids overseas to have the tools they need to succeed in school. And this year, our goal is to pack 350 backpacks for the kids in our local White Bear Lake area schools and 120 for Lutheran World Relief to help kids around the world. So there are three ways you can help. If you'd rather not go and do the shopping yourself, you can give a financial gift and we'll do the shopping for you. Uh, or you can donate supplies. There are take-home lists that you can grab and uh, go and buy a backpack or uh, fill it with items for each different grade level. Or uh, you can grab a Lutheran World Relief bag that's out there. Those have already been sewn. Uh, and you can grab a, a list for those as well to give for kids internationally. So either one of those, bring them back by August 6th. And then another one of our core values here at CGLC is love pours out, but we can only pour out if we first receive the love that pours in. So we have a worship night coming up Wednesday, July 26th. Uh, at 6.30 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall, uh, please come just for a time of worship and prayer, if you'd like. Mark your calendar for that. And then finally, on August 1st at 6 o'clock, we have a connection night for young adults ages 18 to 25. Uh, food, games, and connection. So uh, you can sign up online or contact Melinda at Melinda at gracepeople.church to sign up or for more information. Um, so please pass the word for that too as well if there are people in your life who would like to be part of that. And for all other events, pick up a copy of The Current at the front desk uh, so you can learn more about what's happening here in your community. So with that, would you please rise. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join in our closing verse. Lord.